Okay, hello everyone. I'm gonna I'm gonna get started. We've still got some people who are joining us at the moment. Um, Jude or Maureen, as as I'm speaking, can you guys um, keep an eye on people coming in and admit them when they do? That would be really helpful. Thanks very much. So good morning. Uh, well, afternoon actually. Sorry, this is our first uh, online event. Um, my name is Paula Mays, and I'm one of the engagement managers at Oscar. I'm going to be your host today. Um, and I will shortly pass you over to Maureen Mallon, who's our chief executive, waving there, if you can see her amongst all the faces. Um, she'll give a short introduction, uh, followed by Judith Turbine, who'll give us um, some updates around the coronavirus guidance. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that we're recording this session today. Um, it'll be edited um, and then put on the website and onto YouTube afterwards. Um, I've put you all on mute. Um, that's because there are so many of you decided to join today, which is brilliant. But we just need to make sure that there's no background noise that disrupts it for everybody else. So I will keep you on mute throughout the whole session, but you can participate by typing your questions into the group chat. Now, if you haven't used Zoom before, it's really easy. Um, depending on how you've joined the webinar will depend on what accessibility you have. But I think everyone should have access to chat. So either along the bottom of your screen or along the top of your screen, you should see something that says chat. And if you are able to see that, could you please give me a yes? There's like a little tick, tick button and I'll be able to see in my screen if everybody's managing to find it. So I'm seeing a few thumbs up. Brilliant. That's super. So what will happen is, as, as you can gather, we don't have enough time to answer 123 questions. Um, so I will take out the themes from the questions that you guys are asking as the, as the presentation goes through, and we'll do a bit of Q&A at the end. Um, don't worry if your question's not answered because um, I will take away all of the chat discussion and I will pass it on to our guidance manager and she will make sure that anything that's missing from our guidance at the moment will be updated um, and you should be able to get an answer. Now, if you have something that's quite specific, you might want to contact us directly um, and one of our staff members will get back to you as soon as they can. Um, so the email address for doing that at the moment is info at oscr.org.uk. Um, so the same as everybody else, we're all working from home at the moment and I am delivering this from my bedroom in Dersey at the moment. So the other thing that I just wanted to say is um, this is our very first event. There's 125 of you now. Um, so forgive me if, if we're a little bit um, slow or, or the flow isn't as good as it should be, but we'll, we'll give it our best shot. And to start us off, I'm going to just share my screen and Maureen will introduce herself and the webinar. Okay. There you go, Maureen, I've unmuted you. Fantastic. It's great to see everybody. Um, it was lovely flashing through the screens there to see um, a lot of familiar faces and some very unfamiliar ones too. So um, great, great to meet some of you virtually and looking forward to catching up um, sometime when we can all um, be in the same room. Oscar has gone through uh, the radical transformation that everyone else has um, in terms of getting everybody working at home. We were an organisation of, 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 of 50 people who were pretty much in the office most of the time. Um, and now everybody's working in various arts and parts. Um, we are working really, really hard to support the sector and to understand the sector. And that's why um, events like these are worth their weight in gold to us. Um, not only selfishly, but because we are spending a great deal of our time trying to support government, local government, national government, and all sorts of other organisations, um, national organisations, TSIs to, to really understand what the what, what the issues are that are coming through and to use all of that data and analysis to um, shape and influence policy, legislation, guidance, funding, all sorts of different things. So I hope this session um, is helpful to you and um, please do give us very honest um, feedback and engage with us. I'm also going to um, unashamedly say hopefully all of your organisations got a link to a short survey that we've put out 
um, to try and again make sure that we're understanding from, from every charity's perspective or as many charities' perspectives in Scotland what the issues are that they're facing because some people are having um, a phenomenal overload of work, some people having radically different work and um, some people having no work at all um, and some people with a mishmash of that depending on which week it is. So we know it's different and we don't want to work on anecdote so as much as you can do to help us with that will be gratefully received. I just also want to reflect on saying, um, certainly from a personal perspective, it's been incredibly power for me, powerful for me to watch everybody adapting to this new way of working. Um, for an organisation, as I say, who were predominantly office-based, we have moved um, to, 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 to being an engaging and responding and enabling regulator from home. We've got over half of our staff who have caring responsibilities. Um, so it's, it's very, very difficult for a lot of them, as you can imagine, to, um, to, to, to juggle work at times when they're um, juggling homeschooling or juggling looking after uh, parents or other people they have caring responsibilities for. Um, for a lot of people, um, they're, 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 they're at home alone. And again, you'll be facing a lot of similar issues. So we're trying to make sure that we're tailoring to each individual as well as coming out with overall responses. So a complicated time for us and um, we hope we're getting as much of it as we can right. Um, we've been listening a huge amount and um, updating the guidance um, very, very regularly based on actually what we're hearing from people. So as you ask us questions, so Paula was suggesting get in touch with us as we, we, we take all of the questions, all of the comments, all of the calls, and we're putting that together as frequently asked questions, not only for us, but we're sharing that with SCVO, with COSVO, with government, with COSLA. We're sharing it to make sure that people understand what the big issues are. So I'm going to stop now and um, just say it's great to see you and thank you for coming and looking forward to engaging with you um, through this way and many other ways. Great, thanks very much Maureen. I'll just mute you for just now and we'll move on. Um, I'll introduce my boss, Judith Turbine, who's going to talk about some of the updates around coronavirus. Jude. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to have this chance to talk to so many of you. It would be an even greater pleasure if we could be in the same space, but this is a great opportunity for us to reach out a little, for you to see that we're still here, and for us to get some of your ideas and thoughts at the end of this session. We know this is a really tricky time for everyone, and as ever are bowled over by the great work charities are managing to do in the face of great challenges and difficulties. And since the start, we've tried to approach the work that we've done to be as supportive and enabling as possible. What we don't want to do is to add to the burden of charities and rather what we want to do is to really uh, enable as much as we can the work of charities at this time. And so the idea of today's session is just really to, to talk through a little bit some of the key challenges we are seeing that are facing the sector. Um, what our guidance says about these what else we are doing and a little bit, I'm going to finish off by talking about some of the support that's out there. The first thing I'd like to say is that when we've developed this guidance, one of the key things we've tried to do is to make sure that we're listening to what people are asking us, listening to the reflections of charities as they write to us, as they phone us, listening to sector leaders as they tell us what, what, what's happening in, in the charity sector. And we're trying to make sure our guidance is reflecting that. So if you see holes in the guidance, if you see spaces in the guidance, if you see parts of the guidance that could be clearer, it would be very helpful for us to let, uh, for us to know that, for you to let us know that. Um, and at the end, there will be a chance for questions. Uh, we're going to do that in a written format, but we will take all these ideas away. And as Paula says, we'll analyze that and make sure that, the, that, that our guidance reflects any spaces that we see from the questions that we're getting in. So what are the key challenges we are seeing for charities at the moment? Uh, there's many, many, but there's three main clusters that are coming to us. The first is around governance, various aspects of governance. The second is around reporting, specifically reporting to us. And finally, there's quite a lot on financial survival, and we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. So I'm going to start off by talking about governance and some of the challenges that charities are facing. There is very, there's a very fundamental cha a challenge for charities at this time in terms of governance. 
how do you govern your charity when you can't get into the same room as your fellow trustees, when you can't have face-to-face -face talks to your fellow trustees, when you can't have a board meeting with your fellow trustees? What does good governance look like? And I think in a sense, you have to take it back to your first principles. There's two main areas that I think you need to concentrate on. One is the idea of collective decision making. That is so fundamental. It's fundamental at all times. But at the moment, it's probably more difficult to develop that collective decision making. So that is extremely important. And then clearly linked to that, but very important is decision making itself. How are decisions being made? How are they being recorded? Can you go back and look at the decisions you've made and understand why you did them, why they were in the best interest of your charity, and why they prove that you were acting with the care and diligence that you need to act as a charity trustee? If you come to the specifics of that, um, some people talk quite a lot around AGMs and around meetings uh, because that's very difficult for them to actually um, know how to do that at a time when you can't get together and work in the same space. Now for both of these, the only answer at the moment is to go virtually. Now again, it's easy to say that and it's much more easy for some charities than others to work in that virtual space. Some have done it before, some have greater skills in that area. And so it is important if you're struggling in that area to seek support but it is actually the only way of doing things at this very moment in time. So it is much better to do it that way than to not do it at all. Now for some charities, they're in a very strong position of, of having in their governing document something that specifically allows them to take decisions in a virtual way. If you're not in that privileged position, what we are saying is, as you have no option, it is very much better to do it virtually than to not do it at all. So please go ahead. And, and get together virtually around that virtual board table and take those decisions that you need to take for your charity. The next area we're hearing quite a lot on is a, that you can't do something that's very, that, that, that's specified in your governing document. For instance, there's lots of charities that have been set up to do a very particular event. It might be an agricultural fair, it might be a festival, something else. You just cannot do these things at the moment. And therefore, you're not going to be held to account for that. It doesn't matter that you're not fulfilling your governing document because you just cannot do so. So that's something that the least of your worries is, is not being able to do it. Uh, and, and we would like to hear about some of these more serious aspects. And I'll talk about notifiable events later on. But certainly, you will, won't be held to account for not being able to fulfill your governing document in, in, in those circumstances. The third one's a little bit more complicated and it's around having quorum to make decisions. That is to say, having enough charity trustees around your virtual board table to take the decisions that you need to be taking. This is a tricky one because if you take decisions and you are not quoted, you don't have enough charity trustees, those decisions can be called into question in the future. And so that puts you in a difficult position. If you're finding it difficult to get quorum, perhaps your governing document gives you some permissions to be able to get extra trustees at this moment in time quite easily. That might be a way of doing it. Or perhaps your governing document allows, it, it allows you to quite easily drop the number that you need to be quoted. But again, actually making those decisions and having those conversations when you're not quoted can be very difficult. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is try to be quoted. If you are really, really struggling and you need to make an emergency decision, and that will be the case for some charities, then what you need to do is make sure that you're documenting why you can't get enough charity trustees around that table. What were the decisions you made? Why was it such an emergency to do it then? And why was it in the best interest of your charity? So that when you go back and look at that, then it makes perfect sense to you, but it would also make perfect sense to us if somebody wanted to raise a concern in the future about you not being quoted. We can then go back and take a very proportionate approach to any concerns that are raised about that. The final one I've talked about already, and it's just about making decisions, recording decisions, making sure you have them in a way that you can go back to and justify your actions. So there are some thoughts on governance. Moving over to talking about reporting. Clearly, this is an area of great concern to people. 
people will be wanting to submit annual reports and accounts. They'll be wanting to fill in their annual returns. These are all things that we ask for at a specific time of year for each charity, and charities are going to struggle to do so. We absolutely understand that. And we, we have said very clearly, very publicly, and will continue to do so, that no charity will be penalised if they cannot get their annual reports and accounts and their annual returns in on time. In fact, we're giving a sort of six month leeway for charities at this moment in time. However, and this is a very important however, our technical systems are slightly lagging behind our policy decisions on this. So if you go to the register, there will be charities who are marked as late and overdue because they haven't got their annual reports and accounts into us. Now we're looking at that, we're going to be changing that, we're taking the red lines off at this stage, but it's going to take us a little while to get our technical stuff sorted out. It's partly because we have to go externally to do so and it's, it's proving to be a little bit tricky, but we will get it sorted out and no charity will be penalised for being late. The second area I wanted to talk about was notifiable events, which is another area that people come and talk to us about uh, quite a lot. What is a notifiable event at the moment? Bad stuff is happening to everyone. So do we want to hear about absolutely everything? Well, again, no, not really. However, we do want to hear about events that are going to have a significant impact on a charity going forward that's possibly going to lead to them having to to change what they do or to wind up or whatever it may be, hopefully not wind up, but for some charities that might be the reality. So we would want to hear about significant events that are going to have a serious impact on your charity. However, our guidance makes it very, very clear that the important point of that is not the reporting to us. The important point is that the charity trustees are getting together to have those discussions, to understand what the risks are to the charity in the short, medium and longer term, and to be able to decide what they're going to do uh, with the charity because of the risks they're facing. When you've had a chance to have those conversations, when you understand what the impacts are going to be going forward, then yes, reporting to us uh, is a good thing to do. It's just a sign of good governance, but we are not the most important part in this equation. It is in fact the decision-making by the charity trustees around the future of the charity. That's the important piece. The other area of reporting that's a, that, that, that is worth reflecting on is when a charity is thinking of doing something different, something that doesn't quite fit within its, its purposes that it has at the moment. You may be sitting in a community and you cannot do the work that you would normally do. However, you're well set up to support in another way. However, it does not fit within your purposes. We do need to give consent for that as the regulator and we can't do away with that. So, that's quite important to, to hear and understand. However, in order to try and be as enabling as possible, we are trying to prioritize those. So if you are uh, thinking of changing your purposes in some way, if you, if you submit that, um, th that request to us, make sure that it's marked as COVID, that it's a, it's a COVID related matter, and we will prioritize that and we will do it as fast as possible. Okay, moving on to financial matters. I put funding, finance and fundraising just because it's three Fs and it sounds nice. Um, as the first thing that is a concern for many charities is it's emergency funding. How are we going to survive through the next period? How are we going to be resilient going forward? Now, clearly we don't have anything to do with emergency funding. So our role in that is just to signpost to the right people who are, doing, who are giving out funding eh, or who know about the, the emergency fundraising um, regime at the moment. The SCVO hub, which I haven't mentioned yet but will come up again at the end, is a great, a, a great resource for that. If you go to the SCVO hub then you'll get lots of information on, on emergency funding. However, what we will do and what we will carry on doing over time is raising any concerns or any themes that we are hearing with funding bodies, with funding collectors, with, with groups of funders so that they understand some of the challenges that, that that charity trustees, that charities themselves are facing. Obviously, we've, we've got to tell them about our, our register not uh, quite keeping up with our, our policy position at the moment. That's key. If, if they are looking at, uh, looking at our register for due diligence purposes, they need to know that charities that are 
indicated as being late at the moment are probably not late and things like that. So they, these are the little detailed things. However, there are bigger issues coming up now, some issues around reserves and so on, and we would reflect those back to funding bodies so that they have a sense of what's going on in the charity sector. So let me just talk a little bit about reserves, restricted and designated funds. Starting off with the reserves, clearly reserves are there for a charity so that when something bad happens, when it gets to a situation where it's very challenging, they can be resilient and they have some money there that they can draw on. Well, this is a bad time. Lots of bad stuff is happening. So it may be the very time that you do need to draw on your reserves as a, as a charity. However, you do need to take this discussion very seriously because you have to balance the the now with the medium and the longer term and make sure you're not making yourself overly vulnerable by too heavily drawing on reserves and putting you in a vulnerable position. But it is a very legitimate discussion for charities to be having at the moment and it is quite a challenging one and getting that balance right can be quite tricky. So make sure that you're having those discussions around your virtual board table. Restricted and designated funds. These are two different things, but they're sometimes put together and sometimes people get a little bit confused about them. And I'm not going to say too much about this because in a couple of weeks, we're going to have another webinar and it's much more on finance or matters and we can go into this in much more detail. But one of the challenges is restricted funds are restricted for a reason. They're restricted because they've been given for a very specific purpose and they need to be used for that purpose. And, and that builds trust between donors and, and charities. And it's, it's one of the, the fundamentals really of, of fundraising and spending of monies raised. However, at, the, at this moment in time, there are some, there's some flexibility sometimes being built into that. Some funders are saying, okay, this is a restricted fund, but let's have a discussion about how we can make this more flexible. That's an important discussion to be had if you have one big funder, a couple of big funders, a couple of big donors and so on. And you might decide that actually at this particular moment in time, it makes much more sense to use the money in another way. But it has to be done with the, the knowledge of the donor and they understand what changes are being made. It's more tricky when you have funds that are made up of lots of smaller donors. And I think when that's the case, there sometimes are ways of contacting donors in a, in, a, in a transparent way that people would be quite comfortable with, but you do have to be quite careful about using those bigger funds that are made up of small, uh, small donors, unless you're being very transparent about the change of use. So be careful with restricted funds, but don't be scared of to talking to your donors, whether they be um, foundations or whether they be um, individual donors about a potential change of, of, of direction for the funds, if that makes sense for your charity. Designated funds are a totally different case. Designated funds are where a charity has decided that certain funds are for something, something very specific, but they are, the, these funds come from the charity's own reserves and so the charity itself can decide to change that designation. Okay, we were saving up to do this, but at this moment in time, that is not the most important thing. Let's change that designation. Let's change the use of those funds and let's move it to elsewhere. So again, don't be scared to have those conversations around your virtual board table. And finally, in this section, I, 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 it would be remiss of me not to remind us all that we need to be sticking to the fundraising rules, even at this very difficult time. So the codes of practice that are very, um, that are very clear about what, what you should and should not be doing when you're doing fundraising. The next thing I put in is just about registration. And that's not because it's a particular challenge, but because over the last couple of weeks, I've heard a, people, a couple of people say to me, I've heard you're not registering charities at the moment. And that is just not true. We are still registering charities and I wanted to make sure we were getting that message out there. Um, and, and we will be continuing to register charities uh, for the very long foreseeable future. But there is a, a bit more of a philosophical question here. If you are setting up a new charity just now because you think it, it, there's something that you could be doing in your community and having a charity is the best way of doing it, it is very important to have that discussion about whether or not that is the best thing to do. Sometimes the best thing to do is to get together with other charities that are already working in that field, already working in that area, and then work with them so that you can have a bigger impact. However, if you still decide to set up a charity, then 
if it's COVID related, you need to make that clear because we have still a number of registrations coming in. We've got some that are sitting there from before the crisis. So if it is COVID related and it needs to be fast, then we need to know that so we can prioritise that registration. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say on registration. What's happening at the moment and what's coming soon? I've mentioned already that we'll be having more webinars and uh, we've got one in a couple of weeks on financial stuff, but there may be other things you would like to hear about. So if you do have something that you'd specifically like us to cover, please let us know and we will try to build that into our programme. The other thing which I hope uh, many of you will have already seen is that we launched a survey uh, on Tuesday and it's aimed at seeing what the impact is uh, of, the, of, the, of the current crisis on charities across Scotland. We sent, a, we sent to every single charity across Scotland, well, to every contact that we have for charities across Scotland. If you haven't seen that link, do double check in your spam folder, um, make sure it's, you know the right pe the person who usually receives emails from us, from Oscar, and have a look at that. And please do fill it in because we want as many responses as possible because that will help inform our own work. But we will also be feeding that into the work of partners and Scottish government and so on. So the more information, the merrier, really. And then the final thing I would say is that we are continuing to develop our guidance uh, and we're trying to make sure that it's evolving to, to reflect the current reality, to what's going on, to the challenges that our people, people are facing. Um, and so it's, 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 it'd be great to hear from you if there's something you feel is missing, something that would be helpful for you. We will look at that and we will try to build it into our suite of guidance at the moment. In all this work, Partnership working is very important. We are a cog in this, in this wheel, but there are many other people that are important and we continue to work in strong partnership with sector lead sector bodies, with, with, with government, uh, with Scottish government, uh, with other regulators, and we will continue to do that to try to raise awareness of certain issues and try to make sure that we're all working together to have a maximum impact and to be as supportive as possible to the charity sector overall. There's lots of support available. I think sometimes it must feel for a charity out there a, a very difficult time. But we do know there's lots of good support out there. I've mentioned the SCDO hub, the yellow box on the right. Uh, that is, that's a great source of information and will signpost you to lots of places where you can get more detailed information. And so that's probably a great place to start if you're needing more information on any area related to, to, to what I've talked about today, but to lots of other areas as well. Clearly there's our website, but I've also put down some of the other organisations that have very specific information around a support for the sector at the moment. So it's worth having a look at those. I've put down, for instance, the Scotland's International Development Alliance, because if you're in an international organisation, that's a great place to go to get specific information. There's the, you, your local third sector interface, we're constantly uh, telling people to go in and, and chat to them. So make sure that you're making use of these uh, support organisations. You can get at them there's links to them on our website but you can also get at them from 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 google or from you know through the the, the scdo hub so please seek support if you need because we know it's a very very tricky time for everybody i just want to finish by saying it's been great to have a chance to talk to you this is our first webinar uh, we weren't quite sure how it was going to go it's been great having so many people here we are definitely all in this together. So anything you can share with us that will help us to be better at our role in enabling and supporting the sector, the better. So we would love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to chat to you this afternoon. Thanks, Jude. Um, we've had a few questions. If you just bear with me, I'm going to stop sharing my screen just now. And I'm going to unmute some of my Oscar colleagues and we'll, we'll kind of get started with some of the questions. So I will start, um, I'll start from the beginning. So Eliza would like to know from somebody, um, people can hold AGMs virtually at the moment. Is this only for this, this time at the moment or, or will that be a possibility in the future? Um, who would like to ask? I that would say. Oh, Paula. 
Go. Yeah. yeah go. <laughs> okay. And yeah, maybe say the name. Sorry. And um, maybe it's somebody else will want. To control. I mean, I think things changed sort of forever. This has been a great trial run at having to work virtually. I think what we would want to get to a stage of is giving people the options to be able to do that. Because it's quite an inclusive way of working sometimes for people who cannot travel or can't get to different places. If we want to open up our boardrooms to different kinds of people, then working virtually can be a great thing to do. So while this will, this will certainly carry on for a, um, a, a longish period of time, because there's going to be quite a while where people can't go back, uh, can't get out of the house, I think it's something that we would want to see happening increasingly in the future. I don't know if anybody else wants to respond to that. Laura? I would just say that having that increased flexibility there, um, you know, providing that option is a really good thing. As G says, you know, it's a very inclusive way, but it's also a very flexible way to operate just in case you need to have a meeting on a virtual basis instead of face to face all the time. Great. OK, thanks very much. Um, Alongside that, we were asked for some recommendations on platforms. Um, we don't really give recommendations, but there's lots of options out there. We're using Zoom at the moment, but there's, there's a myriad of options available. Um, some people I know are using WhatsApp, some people are using FaceTime. Some people are more interested in having something that's super, super, super secure, depending on the nature of your business. You might want to consider something like BlueJeans, GoToWebinar, something like that. But have a good look at the options that are available to you and think about when you're setting up your meetings, how you can do it so it's going to be um, the most secure way possible. Um, so, for example, you know, sending the, um, the meeting details and the password separately is, is one way that you can do that. Um, we had a wee note from Gillian Harkness to say that she has written a few blogs on holding virtual meetings, both AGMs and um, board meetings. These are available on Third Force News and um, she is very welcome. She's very happy for anybody to get in touch with her if they're looking for any more information around that kind of stuff. Um, okay, next up, there's a question about reserves. So some people are saying that they, they've been knocked back from funding, Jude, because they already have reserves. So how, how can they persuade funders that that, that reserve money is really important and um, perhaps that they could get some help? Um, that's a very good question. I've just got rid of the screen now, hang on. Um, that's a good question and Laura might also want to come in on that one, but it is a discussion, a live discussion amongst the funding, um, amongst the funding groups. Um, I sat in a very interesting uh, meeting last week hosted by SEVO where that was one of the topics that came up. Clearly the funds, if funds are, um, are out there, the resilience fund is for emergency and so they are looking at the level of reserves and they're saying well you're okay at the moment but you're not and so i think it's something that it, we will continue we're going to do work on and Laura will probably say this a bit more but certainly something we're going to be active on just in that issue that yes it's good to have reserves yes you, there's a level of reserves which will help you to be resilient but once you've eaten into that then you become vulnerable as well so the funding community is taking that seriously they're working out what they can do about that and some funders will have different approaches to that than others um, but Laura's probably got some specific uh, uh, in predictions on that Laura the only other thing I would really add to that is try and have a really good open conversation with your funder um, to help your funder understand about what you may be planning to do going forward, you know, because part of your future plans um, and how you finance those future plans might have actually been about the use of some of your reserves. So try and have a good open conversation about the needs of your beneficiaries at the moment and in the, in the longer term as well. Um, having that two way dialogue, I think, is a really key thing here. But as Jude says, we are obviously trying to be a really um, key part of the conversation with the funding community as well. Super. I hope, I hope that's helped a little bit. Um, we'll, we'll certainly reflect that back to Caroline after the meeting um, to make sure that we can... Oh, I'm getting some feedback from someone. Um, so that we can make sure that we're covering this appropriate for you guys. Um, I just wanted to mention, because there's been quite a lot of chat about the survey, um, the survey that was sent out was sent out to every charity, but it was sent out to the principal contact for each of the charities. So if you haven't received it, don't worry. Um, the person who's the principal contact for your charity will have received this email. Um, and they should have received it yesterday, I think. Ian, is that right? Yeah, Tuesday. 
Tuesday, sorry. Aye, so if it's if it's not appearing in the inbox, I might want to check um, the like junk email or something just in case. But it was a, it's a principal contact email, and the reason for that is we're kind of looking for one response per charity. So we sent it out to everybody. We might get multiple ones with, with larger charities, so it might skew the results. So um, I, if you uh, keep in contact with your principal contact and coordinate a, a survey response together, that'd be great. Super. Thanks, Ian. Um, this is an interesting question. Is the recorded Zoom meeting by trustees legally binding as the minutes of a regular approved minutes would be? So is it the same? Uh, Laura, do you want to jump in on that one? <laughs> Thanks for that, Paula. No problem. <laughs> um, I guess it partly depends on actually what your governing document really says about any procedure to approve minutes after, after a trustee meeting. If your if your governing document is silent on that basis, then it's possible that a recording of a Zoom meeting could be, I think, considered to be, you know, a, a true accurate reflection of what was actually discussed. But I would encourage charities to have a look at their governing document to see what it, as I say, what it says about the procedure for approving minutes. Super, thanks. Um, is there a need to amend their articles or their constitution to do this? To have a virtual meeting? Yeah. Again, I think it depends on what your governing document already says about how you hold a meeting. If it's really silent on it and it doesn't preclude you from holding a virtual meeting, then I don't think you do necessarily have to make a change to the governing document. If, however, it, it is very specific in saying that your meeting has to be face to face, then you would need to make a change to your governing document. And that should be hopefully quite an easy thing to do. Um, I would expect that most charities will actually have the power to make the change to their governing document fairly easily to do that. And then you just need to um, notify us of that change. You don't need obviously to seek our consent for such a change. Great. Thanks, Laura. I hope that I hope that's helpful for people. Um, this is an interesting one. I'm concerned that an AGM held on Zoom might be challenged by some older members who don't have the technology to be able to attend. Jude? Can I come in that one, Paula? Yeah. And then I'll pass it back to Laura. Um, there's no doubt that people might be uncomfortable and find this difficult. Um, but I think if you take the, the sort of bottom line of that, which is um, if you if you can't, you know, I'm a trustee on a, on a charity, and we're having our AGM in the in the next few weeks. Um, if you can't do it, then you can't actually do the important work of your charity. So I think couching it in the terms of um, we understand your reticence, we understand why this is a little bit tricky for you. We will we we will we may go back to face to face AGMs in the future, but we really want to get this business done so you can get involved in the life of the charity. And sort of couching it in those terms about the importance of carrying on with the governing job of the charity might help some people some more people come on board. I don't know if there's other opinions. Anyone else want to come in on that? No. Okie doke. Um, let's see what else. Ah, interesting. Uh, Anne, I presume from um, Sterling Voluntary Enterprises, said we've had some feedback from trustees that they're able to schedule meetings more easily, as in the past people were late or not able to make meetings as travelling was a problem, and and this isn't any longer a problem working from home. So, you know, there are there are problems. Definitely going to be some benefits to to this kind of working. Um, there's lots of suggestions in the chat around different platforms that people can use. So if you are thinking about doing that, it's worth having a wee scroll through. Um, Trish has said, we have had to request an extension for accounts to be submitted to Companies House. And we had been concerned about being unable to submit them to Oscar by the end of May. Um, hopefully, Trish, you're feeling a wee bit more, um, you're feeling more comforted by what Jude said, but Jude, do you want to just reiterate our, our position on this? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because what we haven't, what's different with us is we're not creating a sort of legal extension to the accounts. What we're saying is we're giving a six month flexibility period and nobody will be penalised. So I don't think anybody sitting out there is going to be silly with their accounts should be worried about it at all for us in, in terms of what, of our approach to that. Um, for some charities, they may want to get them in, a, if they can get them in on time, get them in on time. That's great. That's another weight off your mind. But definitely, you know, we, we are not, that. that's the, 
the least of your worries, getting them done, getting them in when you can in the next few months is the most important thing, not worrying about, you know, being slightly late for us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've just had a wee note from Hugh Grant to say that maybe as well as the recording, you could make available a summary of the key points from the chat, especially suggestions. We will do that. We can, we can very easily do that. That's no problem whatsoever. I'm conscious that we're coming um, just about to the end of our time just now. Maureen, would you like to kind of wrap us up a bit? Sure. Thanks, Paula. What's been fascinating is the questions that are coming through. So there's a few things for, for us that we need to take away. Um, I can see a number of you are still saying, um, I've had a quick look and I'm, uh, even though I'm the principal contact, I've checked spam and so on, I'm not getting the survey. We don't want anybody sitting out there um, feeling that they're being left out. Um, so we can have a, 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 a quick a quick look at that. And Ian wants to come in on that. I just want to understand what we've what, what might have happened with principal contact. So Ian, is there anything you want to pick up on? It's just that um, you should really go into Oscar online and check the email address and make sure it matches up with the one um, that you suspect because it could be it's a different email address or there's a typo in it or something like that um, and if you've still not got it at that point um, so if email addresses match up then send a send something to the info box and someone will look at it then that would suggest that you sort of go in there first because that's 99.9% .9 of the time that, that's the issue. Yeah, and, and it's one of those times where um, ha having your email up to date with us is not always the most important thing in town, and we get that. Um, but I think at this point, um, it, it suddenly might be, oh gosh, yeah, I, I swapped over or I changed, and, and we changed that a couple of months ago, and we didn't manage to do that. So please do double check if you're sitting there thinking you're not having your voice heard. Um, we're trying to get it out in as many channels as we can. It's really reassuring to me to see um, that a lot of the, the sharing and concepts that are coming up about let's, uh, let, let's get in touch with each other around some of these areas. I do think the, uh, the concepts around intergenerational support are very, very helpful. All of us will have heard about that on a personal basis. Um, the, the amount of um, intergeneral, intergenerational support that I'm getting from, um, from, from, from some of the, our younger staff members, never mind anything else, are hugely helpful. Um, when I got my new, um, got, when I got my new um, groovy headphones, one of them was, however, telling me I should get a new gaming name, and I'm really scared to try and come up with one in case I'm actually to come up with something rude. So at the moment, <laughs> I'm just going with something mundane. But um, I think the, the main thing I would say is don't be scared to, to keep things moving. But equally, don't be scared to stop and ask. We are still working. Um, the aggravation can be that um, we're, we're, we're not immediately on the end of a phone, but we are um, we're strongly suggesting please get in touch with us at the email that, that Paula gave out at the beginning. We are getting back to people very quickly and we're prioritising um, as much as we can anything that looks specifically COVID related um, so that we are getting back to people if they're saying, I need to radically change my purposes in a hurry. I need to do something very different. We've been really, really pleased at how quickly we can adapt and change. Um, it's uh, just looking at the rest of the the chat. I think we've covered off most of most of the area that uh, most of the areas that have been mentioned, um, and I think yeah, it's been it's been incredibly helpful to us to be able to do that. So um, any feedback will be gratefully received. Um, thank you very much to my colleagues for engaging um, as openly. Um, it's quite a strange thing being be, being uh, being an enabling regulator takes you into two different spaces. You've got to be able to respond, but also people expect you to have a very detailed, immediate answer to to things. So they've been on the spot and handled it beautifully. But I am a bit biased. Um, I hope you feel so too, and I hope anything that you wanted to bring through has been resolved. If it hasn't been, we're happy to pick it up later. But thank Thank you very much for your engagement. Yep, and that's it. That's us for today. Thanks, folks. Um, we are holding another webinar in two weeks' time. That one will be very specifically around um, accounts, like preparation of accounts and um, reporting to Oscar. Um, and hopefully, um, you guys, some of you will get in touch and let me know if you've got ideas of other things that you want to hear about. Um, the COVID series will probably um, continue for the next period of time it could be that we do another one another update session in a month's time I'm not really sure at the moment but thank you very much for coming and um, get in touch if you need anything from us and take care and stay safe out there okay bye, -bye. <laughs>